just because I'm standing up here, if you happen to have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, raise your hand or get my attention in some way that doesn't hurt me, <laughs> and I'll try to respond. We're going to continue what we've been doing and started in the Zoom meetings on uh, Wednesday night. And we will, we're ready to start, actually, the letter, the first epistle of uh, Paul to the Corinthians. And I'm going, as I say, follow that same procedure as we've been doing. Now, maybe later on, things maybe even get back more to normal. We'll continue with the Bible geography that we started a long time ago. That may seem like that's so long ago. We need to start back to the beginning again, but anyway... We're going to continue this for a while. Starting in uh, 1 Corinthians, I have always been pointing out there are certain key verses, and I don't mean again to say these are the only key verses, but I call them key verses. You know, key unlocks something. I call them key verses because it helps you get the theme of the whole book, from what direction the writer is going and uh, what he's going to be dealing with in a general way in which he will develop in the specifics within the body of the letter. And I would say that uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, should uh, be a, a key verse for the whole letter. Chapter 3, 1 through 5. He writes, remember, I'll emphasize this over and over again. These are people that heard the gospel from the heart, believed and obeyed it. They're added to the church by the Lord. But look what a mess they're going to be in. And you're already familiar enough with the Corinthian church as it's presented in 1 Corinthians to see what a mess it was in. But we read here, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat. For hitherto you are not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able, for you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, and yet an, are you not carnal? <clears throat> who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? but ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. I would say added to that is a verse we quote most often, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, or at least reference it when it comes to how the business of the Lord's church is to be done. And that's uh, chapter 40 of verse 14. Chapter 40 of verse 14 that all things be done decently and in order. I made a comment to somebody standing around talking, or maybe it was in class or both places, I don't remember, some time ago, that really that's the theme of how you live your life on earth. God, by giving us his word, is telling us how to do all things decently and in order. And as an individual... Christian, whether it's having to do with my role as a man, as a husband, as a father, or whether it's children or wives and mothers and so forth, then the Bible's saying here's how to live your life in every one of those roles decently and in order. And you'll, know, you'll notice the will that's involved. That won't happen unless I want it to happen. It just won't. If you're going to be a godly man, you have to want to be. And that want to be has to be strong enough to drive you to do it. And it has to be strong enough that when you continue off and on, at least, to stumble and fall, you get back up and dust yourself off and hit it again. People don't understand that about being faithful. That is an, a very important part of what it is to be faithful. You stumble. You get up, you keep going. That's why Paul could say, forgetting those things that are behind. You know, we usually think about that being mistakes, forgetting those things that are behind. That's also talking about great accomplishments for the Lord. That's over and done with. What are you going to do about today? 
So you did convert five people last year. What have you done today? So there is that motivation and what's involved in but let all things be done decently in order. And that has to do with, with who, whatever we're doing, planning on preaching, uh, our own personal study. How would you re- what part of life would you remove that admonition from? And how would you follow the teaching of any part of the Bible that talks about growing and developing in the knowledge and practice of the truth so that you wouldn't be carnal? Not only that, but notice the word carnal. We tend to use the word carnal more or less thinking about very more lax. And that's the way it's come down. But that's not necessarily what it means in its original form. Carnal means you basically are thinking like the world, absence of revelation, just doing, doing what comes naturally. Now, it's true those people end up going into all sorts of immorality. But, folks, this letter's written to the church. And what, what do you find in this church among brethren? So carnality in its fundamental form means that you're a sensual person. Everything's fleshly. Your desires are for this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's what governs you. For the person educated with God's Word, there's a higher calling. There's something to do otherwise. There's more than self to be concerned about. There's the desire to will yourself to do God's will in general and in particular. So all that's involved. So that's the reason I say these are two uh, passages of Scripture that go a long way toward letting us see what he's dealing with as to where he's coming from and all that he has to say to the Corinthians. A thought, besides verses and the thoughts we've already presented, but one particular thought is the lordship of Jesus. We sing Jesus is my friend. Jesus knows, Jesus cares, and all this kind of thing, and so he is. But above all, he's our Lord. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not leave things which I say? So the title Lord, you'll find, is affixed to the name of Christ no less than six times in the first ten verses. Now, here's the point. If he was really their Lord, and they really thought of him properly as a Lord, and they had that relationship, all the rest of these problems would be gone. Because remember, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The American Standard says, you will keep my commandments. Well, look who wrote the great love chapter and what letter it's in. In 1 Corinthians 13. Interesting that that would be written to a church that was carnal. And that wasn't realizing that to call Jesus Christ my Lord means obedience. You will never in any scripture, whatever it's commenting about, whatever the topic is, you'll never get away from you must render obedience to Christ. Never will. And any doctrine or doctrines that tries to get you to think you're all right with God, but you really don't have to do what he said. And he's not really that concerned about you now and then sinning against them. He's really not. And remember, sin is disobedience. Then that's just not so. These people, if they had had the proper view of Jesus as their Lord, would have had the love of him that they needed to have and the love of His Word, and the love of one another, and what that love demanded in their lives toward Him and toward each other. So the disorders and the failures in Corinth had resulted from the failure of them to recognize Christ as the Lord over all their life and over the congregation. There's a key concept, and I think what I've said already helps to understand the book as you go through reading the details of it. 
But the clue to understanding 1 Corinthians is understanding the mental and the moral and the spiritual condition of those people who made up the church of Corinth, those brethren. It doesn't take long in reading through the book. You see a tremendous amount of intellectual pride. You see all kinds of factiousness. You see immorality and fornication. And you see drunkenness talked about. These were typical sins of the world. I don't think as much as I try to study it, and I can study it even more, that I can even appreciate or uh, anybody else, uh, if he's considered a, a scholar in the moral culture of the ancient world, just how bad off these people were from our perspective, examining them and judging them in the light of God's perfect law of liberty. It also lets us know that they were the church, but they're in a big mess, which tells me the church can exist and be in a big mess. <laughs> When you read the seven churches of Asia, not much good said about any of them, but they still the church. And uh, Corinth is still the church. Look, look how he starts out the, the letter. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. Now look what he says about them. Now think about what you ought to know about the book. To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called, the gospel did the calling, called to be saints with all that in every place, this gets us, all that in every place called upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. That helps me understand that you can have the church you can have members of a church, congregation, Lord's people, and they can be in a mess. And yet Paul still dealt with them as if I've given you time to recognize your sins, to understand you've committed them, to understand God is not happy with that, to understand how you are to be dealing with one another, whoever it is that sins. I'm still giving you time to change. That involved instruction. That's a good lesson for us right here. There is corrective discipline. There is preventive discipline. Well, you can see some of that, some of both of those in this letter. Preventive discipline, it says, here, let me show you how to do it. Let me teach you how to do it. Corrective discipline, it says, I've shown you how to do it. In fact, I've done it over and over again, and I've taught you all I know about it. And guess what you did? You went ahead and violated it anyway. Now corrective discipline comes in because to correct something, you have to have a standard to go back to and say, see, here's what you knew you ought to have done. And it was taught you, and godly people exemplified it before you, but you didn't. Now when you don't, that's because you chose not to. And we're seeing all over this land today, and I see no reason that it's going to cease of no one taking responsibility for anything, especially if it's bad. <laughs> if it's bad, we want to say it's somebody else's problem, not mine. Whatever bad happens to me, it was not my fault. This wasn't. So until there comes a time in all our lives that whatever we do that turns out wrong or that what we knew better in the first place, that we don't say, well, it was my fault. I haven't got anybody to blame but me. And then we repent of it and do what the Lord said because it, that's the only way you get better. I ask yourself the question, if I don't do that, not only matters just in service to God, be sinning against God, but anything you do, you have to say, now why did I make that mistake? Brad, you ever done that in your counting figures or anything where you made a mistake? Was it Barbara's fault that you did it? <laughs> At least not so. <laughs> Okay, well, I don't know when you think about it because of humanity and what that means. 
then there could be people who said, I know I'm going to do that. I'm going to set it up. I'm going to plan it out over months, and I'm going to steal that money. Of course, it's always involved. I won't get caught. But then there's those people who are trying to do right, but they just make a mistake. Now, motive enters in greatly here, doesn't it? The law is broken in both cases as far as breaking a law or breaking what is right. But uh, it does come down to where you were trying to do right and you made a mistake and when you were planning to do wrong and knew it, and there you go. So all these things have to be kept in mind. And the people who were members of the church at Corinth, by the way many of them were choosing to live, caused the Holy Spirit had the Apostle Paul, who established the church there, write this letter. Now, I'm always asking myself, okay, that was 2,000 years ago. Millions of people have been born and died since then. And everybody there in Corinth that this was written to, including the one that wrote it, and everybody else that lived at that time, all over the world, have been dead for a long, long time. But he said, as I read a moment ago, that uh, this was not just written specifically for the people who made up the church at Corinth at that time in the first century, but who else? To everybody else is a Christian. That's what we read just a little while ago. So that covers me. And I must ask the question, now what am I reading in this that will help David Brown be closer to the Lord? I don't know how to study my Bible any other way. Doesn't mean I won't think of others that need to obey it or correct something in their lives. But I don't know. I've never known how to study the Bible where it will benefit me except to first of all say, when I read this and understand this obligation God has put upon a Christian, thus put it on me, how do I apply this? Think of 2 Timothy 2.15. He addresses that specifically to a young preacher, and he says specifically to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a woman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, when I read that, Timothy's been dead a long time. And there's been a whole host of people, more than I can count, that have read it before I ever discovered America. And time goes on, no telling how many to read it afterwards. But I still got to read it to where it says, what if, if I'm the only person in the world? If Timothy had been the only one that read it, what it was originally written to him, and now I'm the second guy that's reading it, and nobody's read it since, I've still got to ask the question, what does that mean when it comes to my gaining knowledge of God so that I can live a life that makes him happy, that pleases him? So all of that has to be taken into account, and I have to understand the Corinthians somewhat to understand why they're in the mess they're in. Well, looking at some background by way of introduction, we've already read that Paul, the apostle of Christ to the Gentiles, is the one that was inspired to write it. And he identifies himself uh, several times in chapter 1, verse 1, very first verse. But then also in chapter 3, 3 through 6, in chapter 16, verse 21. More than likely, I put that in quotes just because of the way we know specifically, such as when we mentioned it in Romans, that Paul would dictate letters. More than likely, he dictated the letter uh, through Sosthenes that he mentions in the, in the very beginning, in the very first verse. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Uh, that conjunction and was Sosthenes connected with Paul who was writing it. So remarks we made earlier on Tertius being the one Romans was dictated to and so forth. Uh, Sosthenes may very well been put here because he was the one that was taking the dictation. I think it's interesting that how many people here have used secretaries or maybe been secretaries? It covers a number of people, doesn't it? How many people here, and this probably would not be answered in the affirmative as much as it would 20, 30 years ago, if you've been a secretary or if you've used a secretary, how many of them use shorthand? 
Every head secretary you saw in. Okay. Now, when you're, whoever is using you for your ability, and you are, as they used to say, taking dictation, when you get that letter taken down, and then you get it typed up, let's say, as we used to, and usually you're going to give it back to the fellow that dictated to you because it's his letter. And he looks over it and he decides this is the final way it's going to be. You, he signs his letter to it. Now, it may have a little, you used to teach it this way, I guess they still do, over toward the left, the bottom corner, to where you could put your initials and the secretary would, you'd know the secretary used it or dictated it. The point is, whose letter is that? Secretaries? Or is the person dictated? Wouldn't it be the person that dictated? I mean, that uh, wrote it, dictated it? Yeah. It would be. You'd still say he wrote that letter. Or I wrote that letter to you back on October 13th or something like that. But did you literally sit down and type it out yourself or write it? It's hard to say longhand. Some people don't know what that is anymore. But at least they, they printed it out. <laughs> they wrote it. No, that, that doesn't mean that. I heard, a re to show you what I'm getting at, at least I think it will, I heard a speech given a few months before his death in Germany after World War II had ended by General Patton, and he was addressing a big crowd of people up in New York. Patton's voice was like that. Most people think he like that. But he had a real high voice. It was real southern drawl. <laughs> He was talking about the advancement of the army, Third Army, over there in Germany. And he, he was just going right through with the narration, but he hit a name of a German city that you could tell just for a hair of a second he couldn't really, he couldn't pronounce it right. So he, as a good speech maker can do, he immediately turned that to his advantage and he says, whose names I cannot pronounce, but whose places I removed. <laughs> and I thought that was, that was pretty good. Well, uh, when you think about that, he didn't do it by himself, but he said, I did it. It's a typical way of the commanding, because everything stops with him. Typical way of the commander of whoever it is, as on a ship, a captain, it all stops with him. Or as Harry Truman said on, the, had on his desk as president, Buck stops here. So when this letter is written and the Holy Spirit inspired him to write it to this given church, as I said all along, it wasn't meant to be written to the church at Corinth for those people at that time. And when they're all dead, it's forgotten and thrown in the trash heap. It's obvious. God knew in His infinite wisdom and providence He was writing part of the last will and testament of His Son and it would remain forever and be there as a part of the pattern to judge us on the last day. And yet here in Corinth, or whether it be some other place, the person who wrote it may not actually have sat down and with his own hand. Now Paul will say one place, with mine own hand. That has to mean that other times I've dictated, this time I've written it with my own hand. And that's important to understand. Just simply to understand how how those things happen. I I one time, years and years ago, and I've often wished I could have had taken shorthand back in my day in high school and was anywhere nearly as good as this woman that took this. But there's two times that I wrote papers in graduate school. Well, no, one wasn't having to do with graduate school. But one of them, I dictated. <laughs> and uh, this, this lady could take it that fast. There's another time in graduate school that I dictated one. And she, in those days, the best you could get was those select, IBM selected uh, typewriter. And she had that thing, and she typed it as fast as I said it. I didn't mean I didn't stop now and then. 
because you don't write uh, those things like you do letters. But anyway, so he still wrote it, didn't he? That's the point. He still wrote it no matter who he may have dictated it to because the Holy Spirit's inspiring him to infallibly guide him. And uh, I think common sense says he would have reviewed the thing before he sent it off anyway because they were that concerned. And a person would have to be a pretty good scribe. And I urge you again to read about how the scribes tried to make sure that they, that they wrote what was what. He closed it. If you look at that, you get over the end of it. And he says he personally signed it, chapter 16, verses 21 through 24. This whole thing is saying, although it may seem like you're uh, too big a fellow to say this, he's simply saying, brethren, I love you. They shouldn't have been having to have be told that. Because look how long this letter is. It's, it's, it's the second longest in the New Testament, Romans being the first. People don't just do this kind of thing when they don't really care anything about you. I've written enough to know it takes time to write. And we joke about it because I'll just say it right now. Between Ken and Sonia, you've got two of the best proofreaders in the country. Now, they can deny it if they want to, but I'm still going to say that. So when I, when I write something and the other things that go into contending for the faith, I've done my best to go through it because sometimes when I get a hold of it, originally it is something else. And I try my best to go through it, and even what I write myself, then they go through it. Now, I've told them this before. I wouldn't say it right now, but uh, after the last issue went out, I found the very first thing I found when it got in my desk was several mistakes we missed, and I, for the life of me, do not know how we missed it. But if you talk to people that write, then you'll see that happens. And if, if you get a book out and you've worked on it, I promise you some way, <laughs> I'm about to say it's providential, <laughs> when it opens up, guess what it's going to open up to that you're going to see the first dash out of the box? <laughs> a mistake. <laughs> and I've talked to various others who have done books, and that's what they said. Well, common sense says, in spite of the Holy Spirit or not, God doesn't do for you what you can do for yourself. And Paul being an apostle and knowing he's writing by inspiration and knowing he dictated it before he signs it, he is going to read it to make sure it says what he ought to. So he does all he can according to his human ability and God takes up the slack. You know, we can't, we, we've got to understand that about living the Christian life. When we've done all we can to study the Bible and live by it and correct our our mistakes, we've done the best we could. Guess what? It's going to be mistakes. And that's where we expect the grace of God to take up the slack and God says you ought to. But he doesn't say that to us when we don't try. He doesn't say that to us when we haven't put our whole energy into it to try to be as right as we can. Paul put it this way about his, his own life that he buffeted his body and brought it in subjection, lest after having preached to others, he himself was cast away. So what does that say about Paul living for the Lord? I'm doing all I can in and of myself to keep myself in the truth of God. And yet we're saved by grace through faith. So all that's involved, and it tells us why Paul would write to these brethren and the background they came out of and why he was so long-suffering with them, even though they're engaged in some terrible sins, which brings this up. Circumstances alter cases. What does that mean? Well, it means when you got people coming out of the background that the Corinthians came out of, uh, you're apt to be, if you're dedicated and love them like God does and you want to see them go to heaven, you're going to bear with them. Now, most people think that means, I turn a blind eye to their sins. How can you read 1 Corinthians and think Paul turned a blind eye to their sins? What it means is, I will work with you as long as you're proving to me that you're willing to change and be taught because, folks, that's all any of us can do. Think about it for a minute. 
What can you do to improve your life? First of all, the key is you got to do it. Others can help you and pray for you and encourage you and rebuke you and exhort you. I still got to do it. So we must keep in mind that's what Paul has done here. Who got this letter from a man that loved them, in fact, started the church there, an apostle? Who got this letter? The church at Corinth. But it's not going to do any good if they don't will to do what's necessary in their lives to put these things into practice. Now, I don't know of hardly anybody but those way out somewhere in left field that deny that Paul wrote this as far as the writer. So I'm not going to spend much time on that. And I'll show you why. Uh, early, and for those, let me put it this way. If you're familiar with what we call church history after the first century and late first century, all the way up through into the 400, you're going to be familiar with these, uh, these names because those are the uninspired writings, what I'm about to give you. Uh, people after the church had already begun to apostatize. But they do provide much uh, information for us regarding the falling away of the church late first century for several times. And when you read them, you find they all are saying Paul was the one that read, wrote this letter. One of them is what's called the Muratorian Fragment, 170 A.D., man by the name of Martian, 140 A.D., Clement of Rome. Now think about this one. Clement of Rome, and we use Clement of Rome because it was a Clement of Alexandria, and this is not what we're talking about. It's Clement of Rome, 95. Now Paul was thought to have been beheaded about, what was it, 65, something like that. I forget when I read that, 64, 65. Now those of you who are old enough to be able to do this, if you remember back, a few of us can do this. It didn't seem like it was very long between 1965 and 1995, does it? No, it didn't. It doesn't for those of us who lived through those days. Well, this man, Clement of the Rome, 95 A.D., he hadn't been dead, or hadn't, uh, Paul hadn't been dead much over 30 years before he wrote. Now, 30 years to some of us is not very long ago. So you've got a man that early on saying Paul the Apostle wrote this. Ignatius, 120-140, said he wrote it. Polycarp, who was a student of, uh, of the Apostle John, uh, wrote it. I said he wrote it for 150-200 A.D. And a fellow by the name of Justin Martyr, 130. And there are many others of that time said that Paul wrote it. Now, what Paul would you think of in the New Testament if you come across a letter that says, Paul called to be an Apostle of Jesus Christ... Who would you think of except he who we know to be the Apostle Paul? And then you got all these folks, not that many years removed from the time that he lived, and they're all saying it. And you know there must be a reason for them to make that comment because they're writing letters, whether they taught the truth or not, doesn't make one bit of difference. They're writing letters saying Paul wrote it. You need to know, and we've made enough comments about it, and we'll quit here in about five, six, seven minutes. I'm trying to follow the same pattern I've been doing on on a Wednesday night on the Zoom class. But we'll spend a little time on some information about Corinth. It was the fourth largest city of the Roman Empire. Do you know the name of the fourth largest city of the United States of America? It's Houston. And uh, that's not where it stops comparison either. <laughs> but its population, our population is a lot larger than this. Its population at that time was about 600,000 people. Um, here's what's different. One, one place is somewhat different. The majority of those, those 600,000 people were slaves. Now you may say, we don't have that problem anymore. Well, 
You think anybody are submitting to other folks as masters, though they may not call them that? Yeah, I think sometimes we do have slavery. We just don't have it like they had it. Because when you yield yourself to somebody else's will, you are their what? In doing that yielding, you are their slave. And I'm not so sure the federal government hasn't made slaves of a lot of folks. That doesn't mean we can't, uh, we can't, we'll not, you know, cease it. But we need to sometimes do some modern upbringing before we say we don't have slavery or we don't have idolatry. It's just a matter of what gods we worship. Whatever we put before God is our idol. If it keeps us from doing God's will because we're so loyal to it, then what is it that's not an idol? In fact, we'll even joke about it and say the almighty dollar. <laughs> Although economically it may not be so almighty as it once was. It was the Roman capital of the district of Achaia. And it was the most important city of Greece during Paul's day. There's several, if you look back through the history books, people have called it several things. <clears throat> it was styled uh, the Star of Hellas because remember they called themselves Hellenes. The Greeks didn't say they were Greeks. That was kind of a slang word put upon them, much by the Romans, in fact. The, they also referred to themselves as the gate of the Peloponnesus, the bridge of the sea, the lounge of Greece. And it was very much a commercial center. It was strategically located on the Isthmus of Corinth that, and, and uh, we don't have any, any uh, map to look at right now, but it was joined that was joined north and southern northern and southern Greece together, and it was the crossing point of the eastern and western trade route. If you go to the east of here, you're going to cross and go into Turkey, and go west. You're headed for Rome, and she was at the crossroads right at the end of the Mediterranean world. Ideal place for commerce. Corinth was known. People in Corinth uh, were very wealthy. You can see this in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Uh, we've mentioned it several times concerning the promise the Corinthian church made along with other churches to send money to the poor saints down in Jerusalem. And uh, you can see what he has to say about that in those two chapters of 2 Corinthians. We won't do that now. She had two seaports. One of them was Lycaum, probably heard of the other one, Sincrea, and uh, very, as I say, very wealthy city. Thus, because she's very wealthy, for her day and time, she's the center of culture and art. And the uh, people prided themselves in their many temples. Uh, these meant the Greek and Roman gods, who many times were about the same, they just use different names to refer to the gods if you're a Roman or a Greek. It was, and you'll remember this is parallel to Ephesus over in Asia, but it was the center of worship for the Aphrodite or Venus. You may have read of the god Venus, the goddess of love. And this was... Uh, not agape love. It was 1,000 priestesses who served in her temple as sacred prostitutes. She was worshipped in sexual orgies. Now, mind you, this was as normal in the minds of these people who were Greeks, Romans, or whoever they were, pagans. And the way things went on all the time, as our being here this night as New Testament Christians in Wednesday night Bible study. Vice was considered to be a virtue. 
And when it came to matters uh, sexual, the heathen didn't know the meaning of chastity. So much so in Corinth that uh, you can say it became a byword. And to say someone had been Corinthianized was to really say you had gone down to the bottom of the sewer ditch. It had to do with immoral living, reckless living, riotous living. And that's what Corinthian eyes brought up in the mind of a person. And they said, he's a, been Corinthianized. One of the Greek writers, Aelion, said that if ever a Corinthian were shown on the stage in a Greek play, he was drunk. The history of the place covered a lot. And it's, it's, maybe you all don't find this stuff interesting. I do, and primarily I do because I love history. But the second reason is this is where Paul and our brethren in the first century were spreading the gospel, defending the faith, and living righteous lives amongst all this mess. They didn't know anything about freedom of religion. They had nothing of a constitution that had the Bill of Rights. They didn't know anything about that. But if they were faithful to God, since faith comes by hearing the Word of God, they knew the Word of God, and they knew how God wanted them to live. The Romans in 146 burned the city, and uh, the Romans did that. And when you read that part of the world about the Romans spreading, and they took, made the empire, that's, they did that a lot, and they slaughtered the citizens. They also, I had a Roman history teacher ages ago, he said one thing that kept the Roman Empire going for so many years is because they knew how to make a good peace. In other words, they come in and, as you say at home, stomp a mud hole in you and then say, but now if you are submissive to us and mind your P's and Q's, this would have been back in the days of the Republic, then uh, you can be a Roman citizen in so many years and everybody in the city will be. And here comes Julius Caesar along, who has but one thing in mind, I'm going to be the big guy. And he uh, rebuilt the city in about 46, not too long before he was assassinated. She had so-called cultural advantages. Uh, maybe you, I know you've heard of the Olympics, but one of the big games, if you're ready at that time, was the Isthmian Games, and they were second only to the Olympics. She had an outdoor theater that seated 20,000 people and had a covered theater that seated some 3,000 people. And the two letters that we're going to study here, written to the Corinthian church, church I don't think can be fully appreciated any more than our times. Or maybe I should say it this way, be far more appreciated when you understand the culture of the time, the society of the time, the government of the time, uh, this background knowledge becomes important. Now you're, you're saying to me, well, do you believe, David, that you can go to heaven without knowing any things you've been talking about in the last few minutes? Well, certainly I do. But you'll have, I, I think you can go to heaven without knowing Greek either, but I'm glad somebody did or I wouldn't be reading this in English. So these things are aids they're expeditious, and they help us, and they give us a deeper meaning. Now, you know, a lot of us remember when the old thing you had in a television set was black and white. Well, I still don't mind watching black and white movies. But I have some grandkids that can't figure out why in the world I want to watch black and white. <laughs> well, you know, I can, you can watch a movie. Some of them have been made over later same movie, and, and they were of color then. What's the difference in the same script and everything feeling filmed in color and the thing being filmed in black and white? What's the difference? Do you lose the storyline? Do you lose the whole thing that pertains to what the movie's about? No. Well, what makes the difference? Well, you can see all the little colors. You can see more of what is real. 
And when you got letters written to the church that was converted out of this bunch like this is, then uh, when you know something about where they came from, it makes you understand why they just didn't drop things immediately and why they had to be scolded and rebuked and exhorted and why Paul bore with them like he did and then taught them why he did that by writing 1 Corinthians 13. And yet we see them doing some things and we think, what? why did they do that? Well, look what they came out of. Look what they're trying to cast off. Remember, these folks heard that gospel preached that you heard, that I heard, and they believed it. And from the heart, they obeyed it. Now, why did they do that? Same reason I did, you did. And yet, cutting themselves loose from that world that had become so common over thousands of years, like we read of the Gentiles leading God in Romans 1, then... There's going to be problems with people trying to do that kind of thing. And I'll end on this point. Uh, we'll look a little more at the church of Corinth next time around. But I remember, and I may have told this sometime, uh, talking to a, a preacher from America that worked in Africa. And uh, he said that going to the African tribes that they went to, to work, they were warned, you know, now look, they don't, the women don't, well, let's put it this way. They're topless, and this is the way they operate. Nobody thinks anything about it. And, and this fellow told me, he said, you know, that was, I thought that would be the big thing that would bother me as a Christian and the way we live over here. But he said, when I got over there, while certainly it was a bother, he said, they had so many other things not wronger than worse than that in them. That just didn't bother me much. He said, of course, we made converts. And said it was a lady, such a dear lady, and of course she undressed the same way the rest of them did uh, to a great extent. And they converted her and they were there and um, she put her clothes on and all this kind of thing. And they went home to uh, rest for, I think it was three or four months, and make reports to the churches and what they were doing and continue to raise funds. Said they got back and they drove back out to where they were and said she met them and she had top off. Well, what do you do about that? Well, I suggest you read 1 Corinthians and how Paul approached it, knowing the background they came out of and knowing that kind of thing. Do you ignore it and say, you're all right? No. You pull them back and you show them again because it's, it's repetition, repetition. And buddy, what's the third one? Buddy. Yeah. <laughs> And that's not just memorizing things, is it? How many times did your parents say to you and you said to your children, how many times have I told you that? So I, I'm simply saying God's our Father and God wants us in heaven. And these people are not pagans. They're converted. Paul, by the Holy Spirit, called them the church of God, sanctified in Christ Jesus. Well, they sure had a lot of messes to clean up. But Paul bore with them, but he was saying, you've got to do your part, and I can teach you, and I can set the best example possible before you, but if you don't will to benefit from it, whose fault really is it? And that's the way we've got to look at things. And for what's coming ahead of us, if the church continues to be the church that is of Christ, to the glory of God the Father and the salvation of souls, as it appears on our New Testament. Church is going to have to learn that about converting people and dealing with them. You don't compromise the truth, and you don't let up on living righteously, but you can look into the New Testament letters while the Holy Spirit had those writers like Paul write to those folks and work with them. And you understand then more what long-suffering means. And it doesn't mean compromise the truth and tolerate people in evil. Thank you very much.